The American people should know exactly what relationships Medicare have or my insurance companies have with the doctors I'm seeing. There should be nothing to hide in these relationships, and I should be able to make my own decisions. That was Anish Chopra, co-founder and president of Care Journey, explaining why transparency should play a vital role in healthcare's transformation. In this episode, Anish shares his perspective on some of the biggest problems in healthcare today. He also explains the pros and cons of several different healthcare models and discusses the solutions that he believes will have the biggest impact on the industry. My hope is that we're going to move from the concept of patient-centeredness to a reality, and at the core of it will be the ability for me via an application I trust to aggregate my records and to run decision support that's in my best interests. You're listening to How I Transformed This, presented by Versus 12. Versus 12 is the award-winning Salesforce Gold Consulting Partner focused on healthcare innovation nationwide. I'm your host, Clark Buckner, and along with Versus 12 founder and CEO, Tammy Hawes, Each episode, we're seeking out healthcare technology industry leaders, exploring stories of success through the transformation of healthcare. For more stories like this, visit versus12.com slash podcast. Now, let's jump in. Hello, my name is Anish Chopra. I am the president of Care Journey, and I'm excited to be with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really excited to hear more about your story, hear about your experiences, and how all of this contributes to the transformation of healthcare. Yes, thank you so much, Anish, for joining us today. This has been a long-anticipated event for me. I've wanted to have you on our podcast for quite a while. And you have such a great background, as well as being an author, a speaker, and just a great all-around person. You have a fantastic background. You're currently the president of Care Journey, and you served in the past as the first U.S. CTO under Obama. You are on all kinds of boards right now, and you also received a degree from Harvard Kennedy School and John Hopkins. I could go on and on and on and on, but tell us a little bit more about your background and how that background got you to where you are right now with Care Journey. Well, thank you. Uh, Very kind of you to say all those uh, nice words. I'm really a public policy, passionate, you know, problem solver, for lack of a better term. I grew up with an idol who went to college with my father by the name of Sam Petroda. Now, like my father, he was an immigrant from India who came to this country studying uh, for a master's degree in engineering. He particularly landed at the right time focusing on next generation telecommunications equipment. And the country was going through an upgrade from analog phone lines to more of a digital infrastructure. And he caught the wave, built a product or two, patented a number of capabilities, turned that into an entrepreneurial venture that sold for more money than he knew what to do with. And at the ripe old age of 30 something, he uh, decided to go back to India took a penny a year salary and committed himself to meet the prime minister's goals of getting every person in the country access to a phone line. The country had 300 million people at the time and maybe 300,000 had phone lines. And so what was amazing, Tammy, is that in a political left versus right debate, you would often get stuck. So some would argue this is a human right, access to telephony and modernization. So we have to subsidize the rollout of all of this infrastructure to the tune of billions of dollars. So we'll tax more in order to create this sort of equality of opportunity. And that's clearly one path. Another path is, well, the markets are supposed to work and they'll figure it out. Hopefully at some point we'll provide uh, lower cost products and options. But for now, uh, you know, if you choose to live in rural parts of the country, well, you know, tough. That that's that's the way it is. We can't afford it. And Sam said, no, no, it's not either of these two. Problem solving to Sam, and therefore inspiring me, was about finding a third pathway, an innovative pathway, for a small investment, roughly thirty million, 
Sam went about recruiting a bunch of engineers to invent from scratch a whole new technology, telecommunications infrastructure, open source the technology so that the private sector could solve the last mile. And within the decade, every single rural village in India was wired for communications. Everyone got access and it did not break the country's bank. So I took from that, that as I looked to problems that needed solving, and we'll get to healthcare momentarily, there had to be opportunities to apply the same lessons. So it's the left versus the right on traditional arguments, but my goodness, could we all rally around a more innovative approach to solving the problem? And throughout my career in the public sector and the private sector, I have been studying and working with people on both sides of the aisle to introduce how new technologies, data, and innovation could solve problems. That is an amazing story. I never actually knew that story. And you're right, there's so many different ways that we could take that same philosophy in healthcare. I know that you and I met several years ago at a healthcare conference, and we just connected right away because we were both very passionate about changing healthcare. At the time, you were doing some initiatives around provider data, and I think you did some work with the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation on timely, accurate provider directory information, which fell right in line with what we were doing on our app side. And this initiative today, fast forward several years, is just a large part of how we as a healthcare society can ensure pricing transparency and reduce surprise billing. And obviously, Versus 12 is very passionate about that. But share with us and tell us more about this initiative and all the work you've been doing and your passion around this initiative for the past, I guess, four, four or five years now. Yeah. So look, the formula, and it, you'll hear this theme throughout our conversation today, the formula is if you believe in the path of innovation to solve problems. As it relates to healthcare, there are some specific things the government can do. Obviously, we know with the pandemic, the importance of the R&D and the vaccination, you know, incredible success of Operation Warp Speed. And that's throwing, you know, thoughtful procurement at a, at a big research problem. But even beyond funding, uh, governments can collect data and disclose it, or they can compel the private sector to disclose it. Governments can regulate information sharing standards. So information held by one party can be directed to be made available to another. And governments can, in the particular case of healthcare, retool how we pay for care. So the power of the Medicare Innovation Center does allow us to tweak changes in reimbursement that reward, hopefully, better value. So with that philosophy in mind, the provider data problem is just another one of these frustrations. So, you know, you're looking to buy a health plan. You want the best network possible for your loved ones, and you're willing to pay whatever you can afford to get there. And you get frustrated when a 30, 40% of the information about the network you thought you were buying was wrong. Doctor's not at the address they promised, so that now it's less convenient for you to go find that doctor or they're not accepting new patients. Something got lost in translation, and so we've got a kind of an information transparency problem. So the government's been chipping away at this now for quite some time, and more recently has really hit the gas pedal to say that all payers, and including purchasers like employers, have to have accurate provider data. You can't sell an insurance product that doesn't have an accurate directory. It'd be effectively uh, misleading your customers. On the other side, I have empathy for my friends on the health plan world because it's not like doctors are all that excited to fill out form after form after form so that I have to update plan one, plan two, plan three each time I change something like a phone number or I move my office and it's really annoying. So Right now, the world is frustrating for everyone. Consumers don't get the information they need. Health plans aren't delivering what is expected of them. Physicians feel overwhelmed with all the burden. For what purpose? And it's not working. So again, I drew a page from my friend Sam Petroda and I went to my friend Kathy Hempstead at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I said, Kathy, this could be a search problem more so than a database problem. 
And what if we could get all the doctors uh, who have websites, more and more of them today have them, to apply a certain amount of information within the web page. It's called metadata. This is a little bit of a gobbledygook, but if you go to a web page, there's actually a page underneath the page that has all the software code. And in that page within the page, uh, you could actually put a lot of the detail to say, oh, this is what uh, the physician's address is, this is whether they're accepting new patients. And if we got it right, all the doctor has to do is update their web page, improve their Google and Bing search results, and we could use that same information to fuel accurate provider directories and hopefully uh, lower the administrative burdens on the physician groups. So uh, we are in the middle of that effort to standardize what the metadata would have to say to meet all the requirements for accurate directories and to start working with the search engines to propagate those standards in a manner that makes it super easy for doctors who already are investing in giving up a pretty nice web page presence uh, for you know marketing purposes, patient acquisition purposes, to have it double up as a source of accurate information that can be used uh, not just by consumers directly, but by the health plans and, and clinical networks who need it for a variety of other purposes. So we're just in the early days, and this ties to price transparency and a lot of the frustration about you know what what is it that the uh, obligations are of the hospital to let me know my good faith estimate in advance of a procedure. So I don't find myself facing a surprise bill, but actually would know on the front end that the anesthesiologist assigned to my case is out of network. So that could help me inform whether or not I need to make changes or uh, switch where I get the procedure. Yes, you're exactly right. I mean, we need to make things easier for the patient so they know what providers they're covered under. And then we also have to make it easier for the providers because they have so much administrative overhead that they have to do. You know, one thing that we have recognized in our couple of years here working on this problem as well is that it changes daily. And, you know, the website is probably the most updated piece of content that a provider has. But we've also found that You know, back in the day, let's say the days before these government regulations came out, it was not uncommon for providers' data to only be updated every time they had to attest to the data, which might be every year, every two years, every three years. You know, we're living in a real-time world, so we have to provide these updates real-time. So you and I have talked before about... you. You don't have to bite off everything at once. You know, in healthcare, it is pretty complicated. There's a lot of people that are involved in making it all work. And you've talked about this crawl, walk, run strategy. If anybody knows about these emerging strategies for provider data, it's definitely you. And so tell us more about why there's such an increased urgency around the provider data, you know, and you've talked a little bit about that with pricing transparency, and how you believe we can take this approach to bite it off one piece at a time and solve the problem. Yeah, so here's, I I generally, you know, think in in kind of level of difficulty or or what you could do to crawl, walk, and then run your way through uh, improving the system. Broadly speaking, I find that we have more available data now about provider networks. And ironically, plans themselves are not necessarily tapping uh, that information. So long before we get physician web pages updated, what would stop a health plan from looking up a competitor health plan's provider directory when they share the same provider? And almost crowdsourcing whether or not the uh, information that they've got is more accurate than what we've got. And so, It wasn't the case before you could do such a thing. But now with all the regulations since July of last year, at least on the government sponsored plans, and now with the price transparency rules for the employers, it is possible to look up provider information for every single competitor and compare that with what you have in your database. So, I mean, the first step in this easy button is to just kind of crowdsource to see whether or not you know, you're the one standout for being accurate or maybe being the one that's inaccurate. Then you know, the next step is we hopefully get some of this 
web page uh, standards propagated, and that would increase, you know, another channel. And I hope not only will we see doctors marking up their web pages for, for better search results, but the residual of that is that we could actually put that into databases that health plans can use and, and provider networks can use. But then the running part is where I hope, and I can't wait for us to continue to work together in this space. It's one thing to know is the doctor in my network, and maybe even to know the prices that they're gonna charge. But the run is about, is the doctor the right one for me to deliver the highest value service for the clinical need I have to address? And that concept of a physician quality kind of transparency movement, it was in the Affordable Care Act, Tammy. Section 10332 said that Medicare would release its claims data to the private sector for the purposes of provider performance measurement. And while there are a number of folks that are working on this, uh, Care Journey, where I spend my, my days, uh, we think we're you know one of the market pioneers to go all in on what CMS called for. We tapped the Medicare data, now the Medicare Advantage data, which was added in the Trump administration, building on the Obama success, again, bipartisan, as well as the Medicaid encounters data. And so on 135 million Americans, we now have the raw material to figure out for patients like me, which doctors deliver the best cost and quality uh, outcomes. And so running to me is that aspirational goal of meeting the country's objectives in, in the Affordable Care Act and to uh, make that information as accessible as possible. So we're not there yet. We're not declaring victory. We're, we're declaring that we're committed to this effort. We're open using openly available algorithms to apply on this openly available data. So there's a lot more confidence building around what we're using to grade the system and then to make that available uh, to our respective partners. And that may be an area that we hopefully get to work on together in the coming uh, weeks and months and years. You mentioned 135 million Americans. This problem of just trying to have access to transparency. You said earlier, and you know, the easy button phrase. I love the easy button uh, analogy and the easy button example. What do you think that easy button might be? I know you're saying we've not we're not saying we've solved this, but is it like a a transparency button? What do you think? You know, if you were to start thinking about ways to try to you know fight this really big challenge, what what are some of the things right now that you're thinking about? Well, I have a dream that with supercomputers in our collective pockets, uh, we should have the ability to, to designate an application we trust that can access all of this openly available data and to use it in a manner that gives us the best recommendations for our next clinical encounter. And that I refer to as a health information fiduciary that is operating in my best interests, not the best interests of the plan or the provider or any other uh, stakeholder, but me, and is helping me make sense of it. There, there should be an easy button for me that abstracts away all this complexity to give me a simple recommendation. For patients that have the health status and the health condition that I have, the doctors who've seen the most of this condition are here, and those that have the best outcomes are here. That's the dream. That's a big dream. Do you think we can get there one day? One day. <laughs> oh, yes. I have high confidence. Tammy's going to help us make it happen with yeah. the customers that she's working with and digital front door services. And so I, I don't think it's as complex and foreign and far-fetched as one might imagine. Now that the building blocks and the underlying data sets are there, and maybe as we you know, kind of wrap up a few of these questions, there may be a chance to think through economic models that would encourage my own doctor to help me navigate the system. So who better than my trusted primary care doctor to be my health information fiduciary? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. You know, we've been talking about alternative payment models for years now, and there's been some varied levels of success with ACOs and even into in the commercial space and joint ventures between health plans and market providers of, you know, the larger providers in given markets. And there's all kinds of models out there. And now CMS is talking, we were talking about direct contracting. Now we're talking about a different model. It's pretty complicated. But I know that 
if a provider has a vested interest in a patient's health from a financial standpoint to really treat the whole patient, that, in theory, is a really good thing. So tell us what your thoughts are around these value-based care initiatives and alternative payment models coming out and how all this information that we're talking about as far as the provider and their quality and and whether they actually serve a specific member of population, how does this all come together? Well, it's a great question. And, and, and I think one way to simplify the complexity is to think that the move to value and alternative payment models really has two pathways. Down one pathway it's the world of Kaiser, tightly integrated but narrow networks that all work hand in glove to make sure that everything you need is cared for within the one proverbial roof. And we've been dreaming of the day that there's a Kaiser for everyone. To some degree, it's just been very difficult to scale that particular model because the second door is we love choice. We don't want anyone to tell us that we can't see a specific doctor. And so the question that is on the table today is to the degree we have more choice, but a quarterback, primary care doctor, whom we trust, that can help us navigate within that field, that's the test the country's going down with direct contracting and what the new program is called ACO Reach. Can we, in fact, it's a cake and eat it too dream. Mm where I get to, if I wanted to, see any doctor in the country. Medicare is probably the widest open network in America, but also have the ability to opt in to trust a particular network to look after me. And if I trust that they're doing things that are in my best interest, I may stay within the network they suggest. And uh, again, informed by transparency to demonstrate to me that in fact, the doctors that they're recommending I go to are high value doctors. That to me is the aspirational dream. And so, yes, some people look at value-based care and alternative payment models as just one more label for managed care, which we didn't quite like in the 80s, you know, limited choice, HMO networks. But now this new version, it starts to feel like a bit more of an appealing cake and eat it too. So, I know there's a lot of information coming out on ACO Reach, but just as a general overview of that, if I'm a Medicare patient and I have a primary care physician and they refer me to someone I don't want to go to or doesn't have the quality that I think I'm looking for, I can, I mean, there's really no out of network in Medicare, right? You got it. It's the best of all worlds. I retain full rights. I don't have to give up my rights. One of the big challenges, and I love Medicare Advantage, it's one of the most innovative public-private partnership models we've ever seen. It works. The challenge, of course, is that in order to join a Medicare Advantage plan, you have to kind of give up your rights to original Medicare. And it has a little bit of a Roach Motel dynamic. It sounds kind of wrong, but Mm -hmm. in a way to make you think about it, if you come back to Medicare fee-for-service, you might not be able to buy a Medigap plan because they're they're the one insurance product that's still allowed to block you for pre-existing conditions. So if you can't get a Medigap plan, you're not really in a position where you could stay in Medicare fee for service. So one of the challenges is you may love your MA plan, but if something goes wrong, it's it's this challenge. So the reason I'm so bullish on models like ACO Reach, it allows a lot of the economics that you're seeing in Medicare Advantage, where they are aligning incentives to physician groups that want responsibility for total cost of care, now they can go direct to CMS. That's why it was called direct contracting and offer the same deal to their fuller uh, Medicare panel. And over time, CMS will add more plans. And so this multi-payer vehicle for capitation, I think is a very achievable objective in the coming years. And that still requires us to know the physicians, the hospitals that are participating in all these different types of arrangements as well. That's right. And that to me is another big area of focus is making sure and it's in the transparency rules. You know, objectively, CMS is supposed to be doing more of this, but the American people should know exactly what relationships Medicare have or my insurance companies have 
with the doctors I'm seeing. There should be nothing to hide in these relationships, and I should be able to make my own decisions. And so that's why the transparency and coverage rule did require a disclosure of those alternative payment models. We'll see how much compliance there was on that provision, but hopefully we'll get there. At least the bedrock principles are in place. Now we got to iterate to make sure that we're seeing the full value. Yep. Well, lots of change going on for sure. This has been great. I really have enjoyed hearing you know, where we've come from, some of those challenges, but it's always great to hear the optimism, you know, and both of you. I mean, I love being part of this podcast because I get to just kind of, you know, these last several seasons we've done this, I get to just meet some really neat people that Tammy knows and, and hear about, hey, you know, there's some challenges right now, but we're going to get through it. And there's, and this is, you know, a little bit of a picture on how we're going to get through it. So I've really enjoyed hearing about the optimism. I think it's, It's making me feel a little bit happier with where things are right now. And passion. You know, I think passion is key to transformation. Yeah, We'll get there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So, Anish, we've covered a lot of ground today. And um, every time we talk, I'm just so impressed with your wisdom and your passion and all the things that I believe we need to transform healthcare. What have we missed? Do you have any closing remarks or comments or thoughts? Well, I think there is this big picture uh, idea that, you know, everybody says they want the healthcare system to be patient centered. Boy, oh boy, that, if I had a nickel for every time that statement was mentioned, you know, we'd be uh, retired, <laughs> you know, on, uh, on a beach in the Bahamas. But the reality is we, we have a system as fragmented as it is that puts a lot of burden on the patient to aggregate their records. And so the reason we've spent a decade trying to force the equation that I'm entitled to aggregate my own health data with any application of my choice and that I can do with it what I wish to help make smarter decisions, to enroll in clinical trials, take your pick. We haven't quite crossed into that as a default in the healthcare delivery system. We still have you know, I have to log into what people refer to as hyperportalitis, you know, chronic conditions, patients that have multiple specialists, each of them has an EHR system, they got to log in, uh, pulling a, a little sliver of their health information. It's really hard to make sense of the whole thing if, you know, you, you, you can't exactly coordinate that care. I've, I have so many friends that print out all these records and try to keep binders so that they can actually have a little bit of a common version of the truth. My hope is that we're going to move from the concept of patient-centeredness to a reality. And at the core of it will be the ability for me via an application I trust to aggregate my records and to run decision support that's in my best interests, akin to that health information fiduciary. Yes. Won't that be a great day? (laughs) We're all looking forward to that day. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, hey, this has been fantastic. I loved hearing a little about the the passion, the, the dream, all of the above. So we always, always, of course, want to end with what's a good way for someone to continue following your story and, and to not only follow, but also engage. Oh, thank you. I do uh, take an active role in social media. So I'm at Anish Chopra on Twitter. I'm at AP Chopra at LinkedIn, and I'm very keen to make new friends and connections. And so feel free to reach out and obviously visit us at carejourney.com to learn more. We'd love to have more of you in the membership. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Anish. This has been fantastic as I knew it would. And I always learn something every time we chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to How I Transform This, Success Stories of Transformation in Healthcare. Presented by Versus 12. To learn more about how Versus 12 is best situated to transform the healthcare industry and to follow along with this show, be sure to visit versus12.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.